Okay, colleagues, so hello and welcome to a third video in our series on the ancient Greek philosophy. Today, we're going to talk about the sophists. Now, on the one hand, we are switching gears a little bit, because the sophists are primarily known for their ethical and political ideas. But we will also see some of the very same fundamental issues such as the nature of reality or the nature of truth. And in some sense, we'll have a chance to tie these abstract metaphysical ideas to potentially very concrete, practical, ethical and political consequences. Now, one immediate way to begin talking about the sophists is to start with the issue of rhetoric, rhetoric and persuasion. Now, without going into any historical detail, definitely a topic for another video, suffice it to say that at a certain point in time, primarily in Athens, we see a process, a political process or a political transformation, primarily associated with the reforms of Cleisthenes around the year 500. So this process of political transformation is actually fairly complicated and nuanced, but the upshot is a certain degree of democratization, increased participation in politics of ordinary people, which usually is limited to adult males of native descent. And in this process of democratization, if you will, the emergence of public speaking, public debate and public voting, as well as public trials by jury in a court of law, as the essential elements of the political and the civic process and therefore also a transformation in the role and the significance of the ability to speak publicly, to defend oneself from charges, to persuade one's fellow citizens on a given issue, or to be elected to political office. And so as public speaking acquires this unique significance, so to speak, so also there appears a demand for skilled teachers of rhetoric. And so one place to see the roots of the sophistic movement is precisely in the establishment and growth of the practice of teaching rhetoric for money, the purpose of rhetoric being being able to convince one's fellow citizens, being able to speak convincingly in a public setting. Now obviously, sophistic movement is much more than just about rhetoric. And not all sophists were teachers of rhetoric. But that's a good enough starting position for our purposes. Now, so what is the philosophical significance of rhetoric? Why is this even important at all? I want to focus on two closely related issues. On the subjective feeling of being persuaded by somebody who listens to a rhetorical argument and the reconstruction of the argument by the rhetorician. And to summarize briefly the main point before I try to explain it in detail, there are two sources of deep discomfort, let's say, associated with or brought about by the rhetorical practice. So immediately, on the one hand, it is quite evidently possible to be persuaded by an argument which is unsound. And on the other hand, it is apparently possible for a rhetorician to construct an equally persuasive argument on both sides of any issue. Okay, let's explain this in more detail. Let's start with the persuasion. So, I think we all had this experience when we read about a certain argument or hear it out loud, and the argument seems very persuasive, such that we end up having a deep sense of certainty or conviction. And then at a later point in time, against the background of sometimes absolute certainty, we see the argument demolished, or let's say are counter-persuaded by a different argument to the opposite effect. Again, this is a deeply unsettling experience in all sorts of ways and has important philosophical implications. So if I cannot subjectively distinguish between a good argument and a merely persuasive argument, 
how do I know anything about anything whatsoever? How can I be sure that I have any knowledge at all? If psychological certitude is a bad guide, how can I verify any statement? Or for that matter, how can I verify any procedure for verifying any given statement? Indeed, there's a tradition of so-called psychologism about logic, which to some extent could be associated with David Hume and then more importantly with John Stuart Mill. This idea, roughly speaking, that even in math and logic, we accept certain things as true, ultimately for psychological and not logical reasons. A deep and problematic thought. By the way, a good time to remind myself and the listeners that this view is still very much alive today. And so, in this sense, the the sophistic challenge, the challenge of rhetoric, is still alive today. So this is the issue of persuasion. The second issue deals with the construction of the argument. Again, the idea is that a skilled rhetorician can construct an equally persuasive argument on both sides of the issue. Very famously, Carneades, the head of Plato's Academy, the skeptical head of Plato's Academy, an important topic for a future video, this connection between Plato and skepticism. Still, my example, Carneades goes to Rome and one day gives a speech in praise of justice. And the Romans, pious people that they are, feel deeply persuaded and moved by his speech. But the next day, Carneades comes and delivers a speech against justice, demolishing the idea of justice. And the Romans, to their horror, find themselves equally persuaded. So we have this double-edged sword. On the one hand, certitude is a bad guide for truth. And on the other, we see demonstrably that it is possible to induce a feeling of certitude by persuasive arguments on any side of the issue. So this is kind of adding insult to injury, if you want. A double attack on the notion of truth. Now, before we consider the views of individual sophists in detail, and incidentally we will see the contrast between their respective positions, and we will see that sophists were actually far from being anything like a unified school, so before we do all that, I want to spend some time talking about this problem of truth from the standpoint of the thinkers that we covered in the previous videos. So to put this differently, What would Homer and Hesiod reply to the sophistic challenge? What would the Milesians make of it? Heraclitus? Parmenides? Let's start with the poetic tradition. So, as you will remember, the limited nature of human intellect seems to have been one of the primary assumptions of the mythological and poetic tradition. The poet does not speak in his name humans do not have any direct or unproblematic access to the truth. The poet has to be inspired by the muse, by the god. So gods may choose to reveal truth to the humans, but humans do not have any reliable, ready-to-hand, so to speak, access to the truth. Sounds, broadly speaking, similar to what the sophists are saying. But at the same time, the mythological tradition seems to have been operating under a very strong assumption. The assumption that basically gods are good, that this world is an orderly cosmos, not a disordered chaos, that the gods watch over this order, and that the gods enforce this order in the natural world, and so we see the predictability of weather and the regular change of seasons, and all the rest of it. And on the other hand, gods also watch over and care about human affairs. In a word, gods punish injustice and reward justice. A million examples come to mind. Possibly the most vivid one is the story of the Trojan War. Paris, stealing Helen from Menelaus, commits a crime and injustice violates the guest-host relationship, Xenia in Greek, and therefore also transgresses against Zeus. So, according to the Iliad, it is the will of Zeus that Greeks go to war, 
to avenge Menelaus, to take Helen back, and it is ultimately the will of Zeus that Troy shall fall. But immediately there's a prima facie problem with the poetic worldview as we have been describing it. Namely, the strong assumption of the poetic view that the gods actually do enforce the rules of justice among men, punish the wicked and reward the righteous. A very strong assumption indeed, if one looks around back in the ancient days as well as today and asks themselves this question, do the gods actually enforce the rules of justice or not? The answer is far from obvious. Now, very importantly, this problem is known as the problem of evil. That is to say, if God or gods are good, why is there evil in this world? This profound paradox, as far as one can tell, has been plaguing almost all of the major religious traditions since ancient times. And this fact that very often, apparently, crime does pay, to put it in very simple terms, this might have been the leading reason why people throughout the ages turned to the various forms of atheism or agnosticism. Incidentally, this is one of the issues that we find among the extant sophistic fragments. For example, in a passage attributed to Critias, allegedly one of the 30 tyrants of Athens, Socrates' associate, and, according to the tradition, actually Plato's uncle. So, Critias, foreshadowing Forbach, declares that it is not gods who create men, but men who create gods. And more specifically, that religion was, so to speak, invented as a deliberate ideological myth to frighten people into obedience, that is to say, if one were to break a law and successfully conceal this transgression from other human beings, still there are gods who are always watching, who cannot be deceived, and who will visit the divine punishment, the divine vengeance or retribution, even if human law fails. And so, once again, in our discussion of the mythological, or if you want, religious tradition, in the ancient Greek context, we see a foreshadowing of important topics in the later European tradition. So, to reiterate, this suspicion towards religious myth, the suspicion that the official morality of the state, far from representing the true account of the universal standard of justice or goodness, is in fact, on the contrary, simply masking a partisan interest of a particular group in society. This suspicion will later be developed, notably by Friedrich Nietzsche and Karl Marx, each in their own respective and possibly complementary ways. Now, having dealt with the mythological or religious tradition, at least in a preliminary fashion, let us move next to consider the question of justice in light of the pre-Socratic philosophies in general. So, what would Thales or Parmenides or Heraclitus or Pythagoras say about justice? Now, as we have discussed before, most of the pre-Socratic writings are lost, and so we don't really have anything resembling a full-fledged political theory in any of the pre-Socratics, with the obvious exception of the Sophists, and also, I think, we have some fragments from Democritus. But again, for our purposes, I want to paint using broad brushstrokes. So, one possible way to read the Milesians and the Eneatics, let's say, is to ascribe to them a moral view of the cosmos, that the universe is both an orderly and an understandable place, and uh, the objective standards of moral value are a part of this arrangement, maybe even an essential part. I think there's a fragment attributed to Anaximander which seeks to explain natural regularities by appealing to something like the universal law of justice. So to speak, the universe obeys the laws of nature because it is just to do so. I'm not sure if it's the best interpretation. I think it's quite possible that Anaximander simply lacks the vocabulary to explain the impersonal laws of cause and effect. 
But be that as it may, certainly a possible reading, I think. So this would be an optimistic view of man's place in the cosmos, roughly analogous to the mythological view. On this reading of the pre-Socratic physiologists, man is essentially at home in the world. Again, this important idea to see the justice of human cities and the harmony of the human soul as a continuation of the harmonious nature of the universe as a whole. A tradition which I think can be discerned in the surviving fragments of the Pythagoreans and a tradition definitely visible in the dialogues of Plato. So this would put the physiologists together with the mythopoetic tradition against the sophists. However, there's another possible reading. Let me just give one quote. So this is from Heraclitus, cited by Porphyry. So the quote goes like this. To God, and by this I think we should understand to the divine nature. So let's say, to the divine nature, all things are beautiful and good and just, but humans have supposed some unjust and others just. Obviously, there are different ways to read this passage, but let me suggest the following reading, that at bottom, the universe does not care about our petty, local definitions of goodness or justice. So maybe there is no standard, and all things are just and good and proper to the divine intelligence. Or maybe there is a standard, but this standard transcends our human understanding. Either way, I think this quote paints a very pessimistic picture of the cosmos as a deeply alien, potentially maybe even hostile, to our human intentions and designs. Think about this. To the gods, all things are good and just and beautiful, including the worst crimes and atrocities, be it natural or man-made, that one can imagine. I would leave it to the listener to fill in the blanks. Now, this picture is much more in line with a later sophistic tradition, with its elements of moral relativism, elements of sometimes atheism, sometimes agnosticism, and, broadly speaking, elements of uh, proto-Nietzschean and proto-Marxian social criticism. This is where, ultimately, we get the physis and nomos distinction. So, physis meaning nature, and nomos meaning custom. So, according to the mythological religious tradition, and according to this naive, optimistic reading of the physiologists, physis and nomos, law of nature and custom of society, these two things are fundamentally in line with one another. So the human customs are maybe derived from the law of nature. And this identification of the physis and the nomos, this is what the sophists will by and large attack. And I think there are two immediate reasons to question this identity. So one is the fact that customs of different cities vary from place to place. And within a given city, customs may vary from time to time. To give a modern example, in the ancient cultures, slavery was by and large seen as something normal, maybe even proper. So was also, let's say, the subordinate position of women in many of the ancient societies. However, today, especially in the West, both positions regarding the status of slaves and the status of women are regarded in the mainstream of our culture as deeply unnatural and immoral. And yet, people in ancient times, by and large, never questioned this subordinate status of women and slaves. Is there, then, any connection, any deep and essential relationship between the laws of nature and the laws of society? Could it be that the future generations will regard some of our commonly held beliefs as deeply immoral? Or could it be that there are, in principle, no objective standards of morality? Another famous example, often used in this context, comes from Herodotus and his discussion of the burial practices of the Greeks as compared to a particular Indian tribe. So the story in Herodotus goes like this. The Persian king, through an interpreter, arranges this, so to speak, cultural exchange. Again, so a group of Indians and a group of Greeks at the court of the Persian king have uh, the following exchange. 
The Persian king asks the Greeks, would they burn the bodies of their dead parents? And the Greeks say, yes, of course, that's exactly what we do. And the Persian king then asks the Greeks, what would it take for the Greeks to eat the bodies of their deceased parents? And the Greeks are completely horrified, and the Greeks declare that they would refuse such a horrible sacrilege as the eating of a body of one's dead parent, regardless of the kinds of uh, threats or rewards that the Persian king may offer. And then, through an interpreter, the Persian king carries out a similar exchange with the Indian tribe, and now the situation is reversed. The Indians are horrified at the prospect of burning their dead parents, whereas the normal thing to do in their culture is to actually eat them. And they are as horrified at the prospect of burning their parents, horrified exactly as much as the Greeks are horrified at the prospect of cannibalizing their respective parents. And Herodotus concludes by quoting the ancient Greek poet Pindar to the effect that nomos is king, that the received laws and customs of a given community reign supreme in this community. And I suppose that in the locality and in the narrow-mindedness, each individual person, when exposed, or at least when first exposed, to the multiplicity of customs, would flee in horror from the contemplation of this multiplicity, retreating back into this uh, locality and narrow-mindedness, proclaiming that, yes, uh, different barbarian nations have different barbarian customs, but their customs of their own home culture are the only ones which are proper and best. Again, this uh, local, narrow-minded, simplistic attitude, exactly the kind of attitude that the sophists are going to attack. And though, on the one hand, the sophistic relativism is very often seen as something deeply insidious, deeply damaging, maybe even dangerous, one also has to realize that to the extent that we may find social criticism valuable, it is the sophists who pave the intellectual way towards um, social and political change, and maybe even social and political progress if one believes in such a thing. So, for example, it is exactly the sophists, or at least some of the sophists, who questioned in ancient times the naturalness of slavery. Some of the very few people to do so, as far as we can tell. Okay, so we have been going on for quite some time. Let me wrap this section to a close and give the listener a chance to contemplate all of these uh, controversial and, I hope, stimulating ideas. And so what I want to do next time is to talk in slightly more detail about some of the leading sophists in more detail and to try to sketch, and more importantly, to contrast their respective positions. So let us look forward to next time, and until then, take care.